Uh, our next conversation is what are the lessons of the war in Ukraine? One lesson seems to be don't invade Ukraine. Um, this panel showcases uh, our partnership, the, the Plus Alliance between Arizona State, King's College London, University of New South Wales. The panel will be moderated by Peter Singer, PhD. Peter is a strategist and senior fellow at New America, professor of practice at Arizona State. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Peter Bergen, uh, and very much also want to add my thanks to the organizers and everybody working the back end of this. In particular, I want to thank them because I am someone who works in the what if. And earlier today, I posed on social media the question, what if you could ask some of the world's leading experts in warfare about what is going on in Ukraine? And I have that honor, that, that ability to do that today. Uh, and we've assembled just a fantastic panel. Uh, we're joined first by Sir Lawrence Friedman. He's Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College London. He's been described as the Dean of British Strategic Studies, and he's the author of um, multiple renowned books, including most relevant to our discussion, his amazingly timed new book, Command, the Politics of Military Operations from Korea to Ukraine. Uh, we're also joined by David Kukulin. Uh, he's a professor of international and political studies at the University of New South Wales, and also a fellow professor of practice at Arizona State University. Dave is a um, Australian army veteran. He's a entrepreneur, a business founder, and he's the author of six books, including my personal favorite, The Accidental Gorilla. Um, next, we've got Rob Lee. Uh, Rob is a senior fellow in Foreign Policy Research Institute, a former U.S. Marine infantry officer. Um, he's a Ph.D. student researching Russian defense policy at King's College uh, London in the War Studies Department. Um, he also, I would add, runs one of the best open source intelligence trackers of the Ukraine conflict. It is a must follow. And um, we are to be joined uh, by my other colleague, Candice Rondo. She's the director of the Future Frontlines um, program at New America and a professor of practice at Arizona State. She was previously a reporter at the Washington Post. She's done some amazing work on Ukraine from before the conflict, um, some fantastic studies on, for example, the Wagner Group. And and she is literally back last night from Kiev, uh, and so brings um, some great insights into this discussion. So let's jump right in. Um, I'd like to ask all of you, what is one key lesson that, that strategists should take away from the Ukraine war, not including Peter Bergen's uh, key lesson of don't invade Ukraine. So <laughs> aside, what's another lesson that strategists should take? Uh, Sir Lawrence, why don't you go first? I think the lessons are actually not new lessons. Um, they're, they're pretty old lessons about uh, not invading countries where you won't be welcome, uh, recognizing the pitfalls that all military operations have, so don't expect everything to go to plan, and that it's easier to start a war than to end one. So th th there's three to be going on with. Uh, why don't we turn next to Dave Kokalan? Thanks, Peter. And <clears throat> let me start by apologizing for my voice. It's um, <clears throat> early morning down here in Australia, and I'm <clears throat> recovering from bronchitis. Um, I think I have two um, <clears throat> to suggest. First one is that what we think is rational for an adversary to do isn't necessarily how our adversary is going to see things. Um, if you look at most of the received wisdom about what Russia was likely to do <clears throat> immediately prior to the invasion, it mostly turned out to be wrong. Um, and uh, some people were left scratching their heads saying, why are the Russians acting so irrationally. And I think that's a sign that, um, you know, we got it wrong, not necessarily that um, they got it wrong. Uh, we have to see things we, uh, the way we, we might want them to see them. And the second one um, to point to is that sanctions do not have the deterrent effect um, that everybody, including our own president and secretary of state, seem to think they did until about five minutes before the invasion. There's been a lot of retconning since saying, 
oh, we never expected the sanctions to deter. Um, that, that's not actually true. Um, and I think we need to rethink uh, from a strategy standpoint uh, what we think the impact of sanctions are going to be on an adversary that's actually deter uh, determined to engage in a conflict. Rob Lee? Yeah, so it kind of piggyback on what, um, what both Lawrence and, and Dave just said. Um, wars are unpredictable, and it's hard to predict, you know, how they'll go because there's so many factors that, that um, you know, important and kind of explain why things occur the way they do. Um, one of the things, you know, I, I thought a war was going to happen in this case, but um, my view is that it would likely be something more like compellence that Russia would kind of attempt to, to achieve kind of more, um, uh, you know, mi more minimal kind of political goals because if you look at what Russia did previously under Putin in previous wars, 2008, 2014, that was more of a compelling, kind of better explanation. It fit better within the Russian military strengths and weaknesses, and it made more sense in a lot of regards. And also, just it made more sense in terms of the likely amount of Ukraine resistance. And what was, you know, what it surprised me so much that you know basically Russia applied the 1968 Czechoslovakia invasion plan to to Ukraine. Conditions completely didn't make sense, um, and it very much shows, I think, in my view, that that President Putin, when he made this this plan that it was developed by him and, and the FSB, but it was such a compartmentalized decision-making process that it didn't bring in people who would say, there are some issues with this, and or you know members of the Russian military, senior officers, were not in a position to push back and say, you know, you're, you're telling us to, to fight a war that in a way that can, it completely goes against our doctrine and everything kind of we do in training exercises. And so from the outside, just as someone who follows the Russian military, this is 100% this is not what I thought Russia would do because this is not how the Russian military fights or trains. And it, it worked against their strengths. So all these things were very surprising and, you know, not what I predicted. And I, I honestly, not just that I, I missed this, but it, it feels as though Ukrainian intelligence um, didn't expect Russia to do this either. And I think most elites in Moscow, people outside the Kremlin, did not think Russia was going to apply this kind of playbook to it. So it's surprising people everywhere, not just kind of one group in particular. And, you know, I think it was quite hard to predict that they would do this. Great points. It's um, in many ways you um, saying this facetiously. I have so to feel um, I think if I had I a question, sorry, I have some technical I was just going to say for um, poor Gerasimov, um, who is known for a doctrine that he didn't uh, write totally, but then they don't implement and so okay? his doctrine takes a hit. So Good, Candace, um, what, um, what, what are key insights that you would take? So I guess if I had one lesson, um, th there's only one. Um, the, the one is that the connection between the territorial integrity of a state uh, and political sovereignty is, and democracy is not an abstraction. I think we've been hearing you know, a lot from the Biden administration over the last year or so, just generally about this kind of global tussle between autocracies and democracies. Um, and here we have a very concrete example of um, you know, the challenge of having a democracy actually work when a country is invaded by its neighbor. Um, this is not an abstraction. I think the other abstraction uh, that has become a bit of a distraction is this question of strategic autonomy for Europe. I think we've now what we've learned is that that is a distant dream, uh, that in fact, there's a great deal of importance uh, still for the US to play in terms of um, pushing NATO uh, and, and all of the partners Oh. I think, unfortunately, we may have lost the feed from um, Candace. Uh, if she comes back online, we'll um, complete hearing from her. But let's um, uh, move on. Uh, so Rob was very forthright about something that he thought would happen and uh, didn't happen. Uh, and that's part of the discussion um, that's playing out right now, not only among strategist community, but also policymakers everywhere from Ukraine to Washington, D.C., London, to most definitely in Moscow. So um, let's go back around the horn um, and do a little bit of soul searching ourselves. What is one thing that you got wrong on the conflict and why? Uh, so, Sir Lawrence, why don't you go first? I'll put you on the hot seat. No, so, so it goes back to what David said, um, that... Uh, I thought it was an irrational thing to do. It was an irrational thing to do. I mean, it, it, you know, this wasn't, uh, uh, and so 
I, the, what I kicked myself afterwards was, I mean, I never, th I never said it was impossible, but I was pretty skeptical because it was irrational. Um, and I forgot that leaders do irrational things. Um, and here they've done an irrational thing. Um, on the other hand, um, to be frank, uh, I'm, I'm saying I've got nothing wrong since, but the reasons why I thought it would be ir ir irrational sort of guided me in my analysis, uh, as I think they did with Rob and others, about what then happened, because you could see uh, why this was going to fail. I think from, from as soon as they didn't uh, get Zelensky, as soon as they didn't get to Kiev, you could see why this was going to fail. Um, uh, and it's gone in all sorts of different ways. So um, I, I think, like many people, um, I, I, made, I did make the mistake of assuming because something was pretty obviously irrational, therefore this would uh, be noted, this, Putin would do something different, and even if he used force, he wouldn't go the whole hog. And he did, um, uh, with the consequences we see. Dave Kirkcullin. So um, this is an easy one for me because I was actually in the middle of teaching a class with a U.S. Army special operations uh, group when the Russians invaded. Um, and I had been in the middle of talking about the Crimea model, uh, uh, increment, incrementalism, uh, what I call liminal warfare, the way they're going to ride the edge of detectability and not go straight for the drug juggler. And my, um, my colleague was like, uh, Dave, they just invaded. And I'm <laughs> like, okay, stop, let's talk about tank warfare. Um, and it took us a while because you've got to really question your priors, right? And um, we had a team on the ground pretty quickly um, in Hostomel looking at that first morning of the war um, development. And I think in, in that period, the best question was asked by a, a British general officer of my acquaintance who said, um, did the Russians watch us adapting to their grow zone methods and decide to go conventional instead as a reaction? Over time, I think that's the answer to that is actually no. What they were trying to do was that same liminal warfare approach, but on a massive scale. They were trying to basically pull off at Hostomel a repeat of what they achieved in the first four days of the seizure of Crimea. But as Rob said earlier, they massively miscalculated the likely uh, Ukrainian um, reaction. Um, I think somebody, it might have been Rob earlier, said that the Ukrainians might have um, miscalculated. I thought that too, but I'm not sure that's true because of the positioning of the Ukrainian SOF and territorial organizations around Kyiv and around the western side of the river in particular. They seem to have pre-postured for something very similar to what VDV actually tried to pull off um, at Hostomel. So I would say um, I got it wrong. I'm busily updating um, what we thought we knew about how Russians make decisions, as we all are. Um, but I don't think it suggests that they've gone away from that model. In fact, if anything, the experience of the last six months has probably reconvinced everybody. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's why we do it that way. And we don't um, try to pull off a sort of um, Czechoslovakia on steroids um, against uh, armed opposition, as we saw here. Rob Lee. Yeah, so I guess I got a lot of things wrong. But, um, you know, in addition to the kind of things I mentioned before, um, I thought if Russia was going to invade, the plan would be developed primarily by the Russian military. So basically, they get a task from the political leadership, they develop a plan, and that plan would be in keeping with Russian military doctrine, with how they train, with how they fight, all those kind of things. That didn't happen, right? It was pretty clear this was developed by Putin, some very senior intelligence officers, people that did not have a military background, do not understand that if you do a large-scale war, especially with conventional units, you have to give them warning. If you don't give them warning, they're going to do a very poor job. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, I, I didn't think we, we'd see Russian soldiers, mo most Russian soldiers who, who took part in the war, found out, you know, the day of they're going to war. And that has, you know, so many effects. And, you know, same thing, logistics officers, I mean, all, all these other kind of elements, they had no preparation. And so it's not surprising we immediately saw vehicles breaking down, all these kind of, you know, mistakes. I thought that they'd be smart enough to kind of think, okay, we need to think through these things. We need to prepare for this. And they didn't. Um, so all that was kind of surprising. But I, I guess my overall idea is just it, because this is not <clears throat> by the Russian military, it was planned by uh, intelligence officers without military experience. You know, we saw a very different war than what 
someone who looks at the Russian military it would have expected because the way we try and predict what the Russian military do is by looking at how the Russian military trains and fights and so on. And none of that really mattered because the whole plan was developed by someone else and the Russian military was basically given a plan and told to execute. And one thing to keep in mind, you know, we, we often talk about how Putin is a former KGB officer and a lot of his inner circle are, are former intelligence officers. Very few of them are former military officers. Very few fought in Afghanistan in the 80s. Um, Shoigu does not have military experience. So basically, if he's talking to close friends, close associates who are not, um, you know, senior leaders of the Russian military, he's not getting that kind of feedback about what a military needs to to know or to do to be successful in a war. So, Candace, um, unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties and lost um, you in midstream. Yeah, so I guess it- I'd like to go back and um, give you a chance, one, to um, complete the answer to the question of key lesson uh, to take away from this conflict, but then also uh, we're doing a little bit of soul searching and asking what is it that um, we got wrong and why? I think this, uh, I think the machine wants to do whatever it wants, so I'll just not fight it. I hope you can hear me okay. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. So um, I guess I think the thing that I I got wrong or underestimated was the the centrality of logistics, both civilian and military, for um, this kind of sort of land war and and how much it was going to affect um, the lived experience of of Ukrainians. Uh, you know, it takes three days to get inside the country from uh, from over the border, depending on where you're coming from, at least from the United States. Um, and that, you know, that has real effects on your ability to to move th- things and people in the right place at the right time. But I think uh, to Dave's point on the positioning of Ukrainian forces, uh, particularly around the key region, I think he's he's correct that we um, that the Ukrainians actually seem to have anticipated quite a lot. Um, somehow they seem to have managed to to hold at bay. Um, the the pincher movement from from Belarus, uh, which is fairly Im- impressive, but I think maybe if there was a miscalculation uh, or sort of something that I also didn't really expect um, or maybe got wrong, it was also the the centrality of Yevgeny Prigozhin, in who is of course uh, the oligarch who is now I guess very much associated with the Wagner Group in the overall mobilization process, um, I had not expected to see this just mushrooming of um, recruitment uh, efforts on the part of the Wagner Group and its various financiers and facilitators at the at the scale that we've seen. Uh, it's been pretty remarkable how much that the uh, Russian forces have had to rely on these auxiliaries and uh, how important they have been to um, that first you know month or two of the offensive and and how key they now are um, to the future of the mobilization efforts for Russia going forward. Great points. Um, so let's move on to the next question and uh, it's as follows and it's a topic that's very near to my heart. Um, what technology, do you think has been the most impactful in this conflict? And um, the answer tractor is taken off the uh, the stage from you. Um, but given our tech difficulties, we're going to go in opposite order. Uh, we've got Candace. I don't want to lose her. So um, Candace, why don't you go first on that? Yeah, I, I think there's not a, any question. We can sort of say broadly that information technology has been critical, for, you know, for both sides, uh, but especially for the Ukrainians. Starlink satellite broadband was a lifesaver, continues to be a lifesaver uh, for the information environment for Ukrainians in general. I, I can't really, you can't overstate the importance of that sort of civilian capacity to continue to communicate with each other at a time when the entire country is under assault, at a time when everything seems to be going wrong, when so many people are displaced. Um, it's really key. Uh, and I, I think that, um, you know, along with that, uh, you know, encrypted apps, weirdly, uh, have been key. Uh, Threema, uh, Signal, these are really key for families, members of the military uh, for you know US and NATO supporters to communicate freely, relatively freely and openly with each other 
on what's needed in the field. And I think that has been really very important. And lastly, I'll just say it is very obvious that uh, drones are, you know, uh, driving the day as far as um, the ability of Ukraine to sort of use uh, persistent surveillance at small scale, medium scale, large scale um, versus the Russians who now find themselves with their begging bowl out in Tehran looking for uh, the things that they don't have, the kind of kit that they don't have and need in order to provide the kind of surveillance that they need for targeting uh, at this level. Rob Lee, every day your feed is filled with images of a wide variety of technology. Um, what's your answer for which has been the most impactful in this conflict? So Ken has been a lot of good points. I think Starlink is a really interesting one that I didn't expect before the war. And one of the important points about that, and this is true for Mariupol, and this, you know, potentially why Mariupol held out as long as it did, is the defenders there could connect to family, they connect to the outside world. They saw how important holding out Mariupol was for the broader war. Um, that, I think, was very important. I think that was Starlink that, that really played a really key role. And I think that was um, unique. Um, I think UAVs are obviously playing a big role. Commercial UAVs are playing a big role. But one of the things we're seeing is we're seeing adaptations. So they were very, very important in May, June, July, mostly to facilitate artillery. But now both sides are using electronic warfare more effectively. So we've seen a lot, you know, it's much more difficult to use commercial UAVs to go beyond the kind of front lines. Um, you really need military UAVs to do that. So we're seeing limitations there, right? And like anything, any new tech, we'll, if anything develops, we'll see a countermeasure. And that's always that kind of fight of, you know, what, what improves faster and so on. Um, the big point I make is that a lot of the most important weapon systems are not new things, right? I think, I think arguably the most important um, development in this war is that Ukraine's air defense is held out and they continue to prevent Russia, Russian Air Force from interdicting things beyond um, Ukrainian front lines, right? So, you know, you, Russia can't hit HIMARS. They can't really target Ukrainian command and control very effectively. They can't stop them from resupplying. All these kind of things are really critical in the war in the Karabakh in 2020. Russia's failed to do that. And, you know, the most important reason is probably things like the Buk M1 or S300 PT PS systems. These are Soviet systems. They're not new. They're not fancy. They're not sexy. But they play such an important role. They've allowed, you know, more modern systems like HIMARS play a very important role. And so my, I guess my overview is that, and, and we talk about combined arms, if there's any weak link that can kind of, the whole system can fail. And so um, you need everything to work, even if one thing isn't the most advanced, you have to have all at a certain level or else this whole system won't, won't function properly. And that means all these kind of things are, are, are important. Dave Corcollin. So um, I agree with pretty much everything that's just been said, so I won't go over it again. Um, just a couple of uh, additional points. Um, to reinforce what Rob said, what technology matters depends on what phase of the conflict you're talking about. Handheld um, infantry anti-armor weapons were quite important in the first month to three months of the conflict, much less so now. Um, artillery is the, uh, the, the old and most important uh, weapon system that hasn't been uh, front of mind for a lot of Western operators because we've spent 20 years doing low intensity conflict. This is an artillery war, um, rocket and also tube artillery. Um, arguably, one of the most important technologies has been uh, HIMARS in the recent uh, Ukrainian uh, breakthrough. Um, but I think I, I go back to the very first thing Candace said, Starlink satellite communications, distributed, low power, low signature, remote support communications technologies, allowing people to operate in a stealthy modular way um, without drawing a, a massive artillery uh, sledgehammer in response have been super important. What will be the most important technologies going forward? Liquid natural gas technologies, uh, pipelines and gas stoves, and let's hope not wood stoves in Europe will be the most important technologies going forward. That's the critical um, point of pressure uh, strategically. And it's not a military technology, but it goes back to uh, Candace's point that logistics are critical. And in a long war, um, industrial capacity, economic capacity, the ability of a civilian population, in this case outside the war zone, to accept very significant limitations to energy over you know, the cold of winter, that is, I think, going to be a critical factor going forward. 
Slight. Um, I mean, I think we have to be careful. I mean, just given the answers that we've got indicate there's an awful lot of things that have been important, especially on the Ukrainian side. Some of them, like Starlink's, quite surprising. Um, and they come together. Uh, and if you extract one, then it may not work so well. We haven't talked much about the Russian side um, because what's been striking is they're supposed to understand combined arms, but they didn't do it. Uh, I mean, from day one, it was clear they weren't doing it very well, which meant that they were dependent on artillery. So Dave's absolutely right. This is an artillery war, as most wars are uh, of this sort. And the Russians have been totally dependent upon artillery, um, not totally, I mean, largely dependent upon artillery for their offensives of a very particular uh, sort. Uh, so they've made their sort of gains by grinding forward, blasting who was in front, whatever's in front of them until they couldn't cope any longer. But this was very attritional. Um, so one of the limitations of, uh, for, for the Russians in this in the war is they didn't have a lot of the things that we now see the Ukrainians having. Um, and plus the fact uh, when the uh, Ukrainians are able to move away from sort of Warsaw Pact era artillery to modern Western artillery, since moving from a 20th, 20th century army to a 21st century army, it's the precision that makes the difference, which is something that the Russians don't have anymore. So, uh, you know, firepower is an awful lot of war still. Uh, all the information stuff and so on is incredibly important. As I say, it, it, all, it all interacts. But in the end, it's about a applied firepower. Uh, and, the, and the Russians have been dependent on one particular sort of applied firepower without the additional sort. We just assumed we're going to be there. I mean, I remember just a conversation Rob and I had on Twitter before the war about the about the likely Russian air power. Um, you know, where was it? Uh, uh, and so um, I think uh, however much we, we talk about the new technologies and as important as they are, you know, this is... War in the end is about killing people and breaking things, uh, and that's firepower. Uh, and the Russians have got a lot of a particular sort, um, but not much of, of more modern types. So now for the question that um, everyone uh, wants to know, which is what happens next? So uh, let's look into our crystal balls and project um, what happens next in the days, weeks, months ahead uh and um sir lawrence that we're going to go um in the reverse order this time putting you on the spot and um, because you have I mean, a I think, I think today the, on it the russians are losing i mean i i don't think it, in that sense it's that difficult um now how they lose uh and over what time they lose depends on a number of things it depends on their ability to form new defensive lines and hold them uh it, it, it seems to me if the uh, uh, and Rob will, and Candice will probably know more about it than I do, but if, if, if the Ukrainians can move into the Donbass, uh, that undermines the whole rationale for the war in the first place um, and adds to the pressures building up in Russia, which are becoming more evident I mean, the, 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 on, on a daily basis. So I think we're, I think we're in the end game now. The, the question, I mean, like from this day one of this war, I mean, from before the war, we've been trying to work out what goes on in Putin's mind. Um, and we're still trying to work out what goes on in Putin's mind, including his ability to accept um, that he's lost or wh whether he will try to do something big to um, either to make some sort of dramatic gesture or coerce Ukraine and the West into making concessions. But I think it's too late for that myself. I think, I think you, these are things that you could have done earlier in the war. It's too late for mobilization. Um, possibly, I mean, I, I just never believed that the tactical nuclear weapons scenario, some people take it very seriously indeed. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, in a sense, going through the stages of grief, would be, you know, the going through denial uh, and anger, uh, and the next step is bargaining. Uh, and eventually you get to acceptance. But uh, my my. My view is, is that's where we're at, with all the normal caveats 
is that war is an uncertain and unpredictable business and things can go wrong and you can get surprised. Uh, so we have to always say that and prudence requires that we expect this thing to go on for some time. But it doesn't mean to say you can't start thinking about things moving much more quickly. Dave Kukal. I, I'm a lot less um, positive about about that. I, I think that we don't know what happens on the battlefield. We just spent uh, however many minutes talking about all the things we got wrong. Um, I think that in some ways uh, this feels like a critical decision point for the Russians um, to um, step forward and fully mobilize. And I agree with, with Larry and Rob that there, there are limits to what the Russians can do at this point. Um, but, you know, the, the Korean War looked like it was going extraordinarily well for the United Nations in about October of 1950, uh, and it didn't result in a linear collapse of... Um, yeah. Well, 300,000 yeah, Chinese around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but that's that we're talking about Ukraine that is fully mobilised mm. and Russia that is still running a peacetime military exercise with 50,000 troops on the other side of the country. Um, so I, I, I'm just saying I think we should not be too hasty to write the Russians off. Um, but I, I do know one thing with absolute certainty that's about to happen. The weather is about to get bad. We've got seven to ten days before um, the, the weather situation significantly deteriorates across the entire theatre. Um, so what I expect to see is, is not rapid movement on the battlefield, but rather uh, a front that settles down or bogs down um, into the winter. Rob Lee. So I did an interview the week prior to the Kharkiv offensive, and, and I was asked about this in Kherson and elsewhere. And basically my view was that um, one was, was kind of what Dave was saying. Basically, I don't know, but I, di I didn't have a great understanding of all the force ratios of, you know, what units Ukraine mobilized, how ready they were, could they do an offensive? You know, I thought they had good prospects for over the medium term. And that's kind of what I emphasized was that manpower wise, Russia's going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, you know, the longest war goes on. And basically when, um, uh, you know, I wrote an article in June with Mike Kaufman about this. When Russian, the Russian military invaded, they invaded with 80, 85 percent of their permanent readiness ground units, giant tactical groups. Those units were significantly under strength, partially because they, 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 they lowered the TO in the years prior. But then they were only two thirds, three quarters uh, full. And it's because they lacked enough privates. They had enough officers, but they didn't have enough contract privates. And so that that force, so the actual Russian military that did most of the fighting the first month, took very heavy casualties. And so then the force composition changed. It then became more reliant on mobilized LDNR kind of separatist people in, in the, the Russian occupied areas who did a lot of heavy fighting. They took very heavy casualties in the Donbass. The Wagner started playing a bigger role. They started taking heavy casualties. And he started a lot of see all these kind of volunteer units. Um, so, but a lot of these volunteer units were guys who had fought in Donbass before, took and they took back arms. So they had some they had some training. When we get to the summer, and, and, that, and that was enough in the late spring, early early summer to provide a kind of manpower advantage in the Donbass to to take back territory, but at a high cost. And then when you look at where they're at now, they deployed this, this third army corps, which is basically a bunch of regional battalions that are semi raised by the regional governments. Um, they were deployed. They did about a month of training in, in Nizhny Novgorod. They received really good gear, but they don't have good officers. All the officers deployed. They don't have good NCOs. Um, they're recruiting guys from, you know, basically 20 to like 50 years old. They don't have military experience. Three weeks is not enough time to, to become an expert on weapons, let alone the train as, as a kind of unit. So that unit's not very good. And all and, and the, the war increasingly now is being fought by volunteers and reservists. And, and initially, I wasn't sure which side had the upper hands. Now it's pretty clear that Ukraine does, right? Not just in terms of quantity, but in terms of quality, morale, so on. And so a lot of these Russian units, they're signing three month or six month contracts. Well, when those contracts end, how many of these guys are gonna keep fighting given what we've seen of Russian leadership in, in Ukraine, you know, the, the, the ends and means, how they're doing. I, I think a lot of them are not gonna keep serving. I think, you know, the third army corps is deployed. When, when six month ends on those contracts, that's in the middle of winter, how many guys are going to want to sit in a trench in somewhere in Ukraine in, in the winter when the goal of the war is basically, you know, who knows, right? Is there any, you know, Zaporizhia, Kherson, the areas that they control, Russia controls, there's no real significant cultural kind of significance to most Russians in those areas. Strategic, you know, importance isn't very clear either. And so my kind of worldview is that the medium term, um, Ukraine is a very clear goal. 
right? And they have a very clear kind of way of achieving it, and they're very unified about that goal. Russian side, the goals are not clear. How Russia, you know, can can, can enforce conflict determination is not clear, and the means are getting worse because the manpower issue is going to become worse and worse. They've already recruited the guys who are most desperate for money or the most kind of ideologically supportive of the war. They're going to start running low on that at some point. And so I thought the medium term really favored Ukraine. Wasn't sure when that would turn out. But the fact that we just saw a very successful, well-executed um, offensive operation by Ukraine shows they're capable of doing this. They're doing two offensives in two different regions. That also kind of demonstrates manpower advantage they have. And so, and, and also you know, the Russians, uh, it's pretty well known that that it was clear the buildup was happening in Kharkiv and that the Russian command and control did not really take any precautions to prepare for that. And again, it's just a consistent theme. Russian leaders... They've, they've seen battle, it's changed on the battlefield, things that are obviously a problem, and they just don't respond until they get kind of smacked in the mouth, right? And that happened to Snake Islands. Once Ukraine got high Mars, once it got Caesar artillery harpoons, Snake Island was no longer defensible, and yet Russia kept its forces there until they got pounded, and it was just a complete waste of life and equipment. So my, anyway, my, long story short, I think Ukraine has a, a lot of advantages here. I think I didn't think they're going to have this much success in the short term. The fact that they are, I think, indicates the war is going to be um, even more favorable for Ukraine. They, I think it's very likely they, they're going to have conti- continue to have success because Russia has pulled reserves from other parts of the front to plug in Kharkiv, and that means other areas of Donbass might be open. And again, you know, I think right now, if you look at the morale effect of this, the Russian side, Russian soldiers, the morale is going to be hurt by this offensive, and especially the trust in the Russian leadership. Whereas the Ukrainian side, all we've seen is very, very competent, and effective Ukrainian military leadership, very clear strategy, and success. So they've seen we can do this. We just need more equipment and they can achieve it. So I, I, I'm very bullish in Ukraine's this, uh, Ukraine's this point. I don't That's know great, where- Rob. I, I want to be sure to um, get some time for others. So, Candace, um, I want to take advantage of uh, the fact of your recent travels and actually ask you to respond to two questions. The first is, what are people saying that you were meeting with in Kiev on what they believe will happen next? And then there is the question that everybody else had, which is what do you, Candace, believe will happen next? So I'll, I'll try and, um, I, I think I, I'm actually much more concerned about the political situation um, because this, you know, it, while it's a military war, uh, at the end of the day, there'll be political outcomes from whatever happens over the next several months. Um, from the Russia side of the picture, I think we need to take seriously the fractionalization, the political fractionalization we're beginning to see uh, in terms of, you know, uh, officials in St. Petersburg and Moscow uh, calling for Putin's resignation. Whether you believe that's serious or not, I think it's pretty serious. It's it's a big risk for anybody to openly uh, call on Putin uh, to do anything at a time uh, when there are so many restrictions and arrests uh, detentions going on. Um, I think that's a very bold gamble. I think that the um, the, the rumblings that we're seeing online from uh, the far right uh, are representative of something new uh, that I would not have expected to bubble up as quickly as it has uh, and is a real uh, sign that politically speaking, Putin uh, does not have what he needs uh, long term to prosecute this war for you know years in the running. And I also think, interestingly, I I was a bit surprised to find that there is this kind of safe haven situation that is uh, beginning to kind of bubble up in Ukraine. That is to say, there are Belarusians, there are Georgians, you know, there are Russian defectors who have gone into Ukraine um, and found a completely different life, a completely um, sort of almost bizarro world universe in which there is the ability to move around in the world freely, to speak freely, and um, to live freely in many ways, despite the fact that there's a war going on in Ukraine. Uh, and that is a force of mobilization that I think Putin would not have anticipated. Uh, and it will be troublesome going forward. The Ukrainians have apparently given some space uh, to this national a Republican army, whether anybody else takes it seriously or not, I certainly do. I think that they're real. Uh, and I think the, the existence of, of that force, um, both on Ukrainian territory and then inside Russia, is going to be really problematic for Putin long term. But on the flip side, I'll say that Ukraine and, and the Zelensky's government in particular um, is looking at some serious challenges from potential uh, members of the opposition. As you know, the country is now still under martial law. 
Uh, that means, you know, parliamentarians, the media, they all have to kind of toe the line. But of course, there's a lot of recognition that a lot of losses that happen, losses of human life, you know, political, um, you know, dispensation and stability, all came down to how Zelensky responded to the threat from Russia before the invasion started. Uh, and I, you know, I think there was a lot of um, talk on the ground about needing to kind of assess, you know, what what went wrong there and how much it costs and, and what it will mean for reconstruction. Uh, that's a battle that I don't expect to unfold fast, um, but I do think as we get closer to the presidential election period uh, and the elections are next scheduled for 2024, March of 2024, the closer we wind toward that, and of course toward uh, our own elections here in the United States, we're gonna see a change of dispensation uh, in terms of support for the war overall, both inside Ukraine and outside Ukraine, that we have to be concerned about going forward. But I don't think it's a it's a a door that Putin will be able to push on uh, lightly, and that it'll just sort of swing open for him. Uh, the military losses are too much, and I agree with uh, that, Sir Lawrence. That really, uh, Russia is way too far behind now to catch up on anything, whether mobilization or otherwise. And the only option here is to look at um, you know divergent movements, perhaps, uh, you know, in Kaliningrad, uh, using that as a lever against the Baltic states um, to kind of open up some space or to, to make it difficult to, to move logistically uh, things from Poland into, uh, into Ukraine. So, I mean, if there is anything that we can expect from Putin, it will be uh, a sense of desperation, I think, come, you know, January of, of, this, of this new year. Thank you. So we've got um, just about five minutes left and I want to move to questions from the audience, but uh, to let our um, other panelists know that we're limited in time. So what I'd like to do is actually bundle a couple of questions and ask each of you, you can choose to answer both or one of them, but do be aware that there's a limited amount of time. So two, um, I thought, particularly interesting um, questions. Uh, one is to build upon what, Kans uh, what um, Candace just said, and it's from um, Ryan Butler, and he talks about the question of um, what else gets added to the table as Russia potentially becomes more desperate. Um, the way I think about it is that authoritarian leaders um, when, often think um, escalate to de-escalate, you know, expand to try and resolve. And so um, Candace put one thing on the table. What else should we be aware of there? And then the other question is from um, Irene Tamaru. And it's um, both a sort of what if, but also a what next. Uh, we talked about how poorly Russia planned it. I'm going to paraphrase what she has. How poorly Russia planned. What if they had planned well? Or a different way of asking it that she's getting at is, what are lessons that other adversary states are taking from this that they might apply against the United States and its allies? So let's go back around the horn on those two questions. Um, Sir Lawrence. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's very, I'm not sure I want to encourage people to think about how they could have done it better next time. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there is a basic problem if you're occupying another person's country. I mean, we've learned this in a painful way, um, and now Russia's learned this in a rather painful way. Uh, so I, I, I hope that's uh, I hope that's the the, the lesson that they, they they keep on learning. Um, what was the first question again uh, about? What might Russia do to? Yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 I just want to make one point. We we obviously think a lot about the Russian means of escalation. Um, we've also got to think what are going to be the issues if they do decide to negotiate. Um, because if I was them, I, I would ask for a ceasefire. I would have asked for a ceasefire months ago, but if, you know, I would ask for a ceasefire, to which the U Ukrainian answer now could be, sure, as you withdraw. But there's going to be issues of Crimea. Um, there's going to be issues of reparations. There's going to be issues of sanctions. There's issues of war crimes. Um, the, the, there's all of these things uh, I'm not quite sure, given the extent to which Ukrainian-Russian relations now are so bitter uh, and poor, how they're going to be handled. And I think you know, one of the things I would hope uh, the United States might think about this is the role that they might find themselves playing uh, in managing what could be a very tricky transition. So sure, think about the escalatory things. I think they're very limited 
that would do any good for the Russians, but you also need to think about the possibilities um, at a time when the Ukrainians do have the upper hand of bringing it to a more dignified conclusion for the Russians than them just being chased out of the country. Dave Kukalin. Um, I, I agree. I think that the Russians have limited um, uh, vertical escalation options. They do have some pretty significant horizontal escalation options, as, as Candace mentioned, of, of spreading it to different geographies or different forms of conflict. Um, but I think the, the big uh, play that, that you might uh, look, and we, we may see this as, as soon as next week when Xi Jinping meets with um, uh, Vladimir Putin in Uzbekistan, is an attempt to change the dynamic uh, through uh, China's uh, reaction to what's going on here. Um, I think the other thing I'd be looking for is doubling down on the energy weapon that the Russians have actually found quite effective so far. And that, I think, is a, a reasonable weak point for particularly European uh, nations going through winter. And very rapidly, Dave, what's um, one lesson that Beijing has taken from this conflict that it might apply against, say, the United States and its allies? Well, there's been a very, very active debate within the PLA about um, the lessons of Ukraine. And one of the factions in that debate is suggesting that this is a reinforcement of the notion that you want to be grey zone, you want to be asymmetric, you do not want to commit to a conventional um, style invasion. And I, I think uh, that that uh, that debate is is going to play out soon. But um, that's that, that's a, a key part of it. Great, Rob Lee. So not sure how Russia responds. Um, I think it's, it's important. The situation is likely only going to get worse for Russia, so they need to do something. Mobilization comes a lot of risks. There's no guarantee it will improve the situation. Um, I, it, I'm not exactly sure how Russia responds because part of this comes back to, you know, what, what information is Putin getting? What does he kind of see of the war? Um, you know, I think he's bought into this propaganda feedback loop that he, de he designs. He now kind of uh, it, you know, ingest some of this information, which is not accurate, which is on Russian news. So it's hard to kind of see what he what he learns and what he thinks the best option would be, because, again, he, he's so um, misjudged Ukraine resistance, but also NATO, um, European countries, the U.S., all of these countries, he, he completely kind of misjudged. And the strategic situation has gotten much worse. Sweden, Finland joined NATO, all these other kind of developments. So I, I honestly don't know. But the, the options are somewhat limited, aside from what was already mentioned by, by Dave. Um and then in terms of what adversaries take away, important to emphasize is this isn't the war. The U.S. is not fighting this war. And so we're only seeing certain capabilities the U.S. has. The U.S. has a lot more capabilities. So surely, you know, countries will learn about the high Mars are effective. Arguably the most most significant is that U.S. intelligence um, has proven to be extremely successful in this war, both in terms of penetrating Russia's decision-making process, knowing about all these things Russia was planning months and months ahead of time before, you know, people like Sergey Lavrov knew, right? The CIA knew these details well ahead of time, yeah. even though it's a very compartmentalized uh, operation. So, and Rob, two, I'm going to intervene there because we're running out of time. And so, Candace, you get the last word on both expansion and lessons learned in other adversary capitals. Boy, lessons for adversaries. <laughs> I think we've already been over those. I, I, I agree with uh, Sir Lawrence that um, if the U.S. is not tasked some sort of task force within the NSC to start thinking about the negotiated end game, uh, they need to do it now. Uh, this kind of the challenge ahead is um, unwinding this war. And I don't think Zelensky at any time will be in a position to uh, be calling for a ceasefire or or walking to the table. Uh, with an invitation to discuss a ceasefire. That's political suicide for him. Uh, and it would, I think, essentially unravel the morale of the Ukrainian forces um, the minute that that was sort of thrown out there. Uh, so, but key, key will be reparations, reconstruction, war crimes, how to deal with those, uh, and to, to really think about what it will mean potentially uh, if in fact um, there is a tribunal for Putin. Uh, as some have called for. Uh, that is a huge, not, it's not a US challenge, it's not a NATO challenge, it's not a Ukraine challenge. The challenge ahead is justice for Ukrainians um, and stability for Russians. And that will be kind of the, the song we're singing for the next five, possibly you know, seven years, is how does this end uh, in a way that 
those who are responsible for uh, what happened in this first year or two year long war um, are actually brought to account for, for what they've done uh, and how do we put Ukraine back together. And by the time we're having that conversation, it is very, very likely that we're gonna see um, the crumbling of the Russian Federation. I really genuinely believe um, that this is one of the most destabilizing events in Russian history, possibly since World War II, uh, maybe even since the Bolshevik Re Revolution. Uh, and later, uh, we're gonna be looking back at this time and thinking, wow, um, we just weren't ready for like the third collapse uh, of, of the Russian empire. Uh, and we didn't have a plan for it. Uh, I think if we, if we do anything in the next six months or so uh, from the US side and from the NATO side, it's thinking about what is the plan for uh, the in, you know, inevitable collapse of Putin regime, um, but also uh, the plan for putting that region back together um, over time and, and bringing justice to those who are accountable for these war crimes. That open-ended question is a perfect ending to a fantastic um, conversation.